everybody. Uh, welcome back. And what we're going to talk about today is the rise of political parties in the United States. Now, as you remember, George Washington was uh, was not feeling too good about the political dissension that we that he was seeing, and he kind of uh, warned us in his farewell address not to get involved in uh, in uh, in this kind of uh, uh, separatism and this idea that um, that we're going to put pit. Uh, this, the, these politi this political uh, polarization that was happening in, in the uh, country at the time. Um, well, we didn't listen. We actually ended up uh, creating what has become known, e even up to now, as a political party system. This was not the intent of the Founding Fathers, probably not the intent of the people who actually founded uh, this political party system, but it is what ended up happening. What we ended up doing was we... Uh, we had two basic ideas, uh, two basic plans. Yeah, there were more ideas, but they, we came down to two basic plans uh, and ideas for running the country, and those ideas became institutionalized with their own leadership, with their own uh, organizations, with their own presses and, um, and print media and things along those lines. <coughs> um, and consequently, we ended up with a party system quite organically. But anyway... Uh, today we'll talk about the rise of political parties and the uh, specifically how the election of 1800 uh, contributed to this. Uh, this is uh, oh come on, there we go. Our essential question is uh, to analyze the cause for the causes for the rise of the American party system, and this uh, this corresponds to key concept 4.1.1a in your uh, key concepts, uh, in your AP guide. So, uh, moving along. Now, before we really start talking about the party system, I want to get some definitions under control. Uh, since, uh, since these terms are used in a particular way today to represent certain, uh, certain party interests, of course, uh, political parties are ingrained in our culture now, um, and, um, and policy beliefs and ideas uh, I want to kind of separate out these terms from how they are used in modern jargon uh, to how they are or what they really mean as far as the historian is concerned. And, uh, and in the study of history, especially when we go back 200 years and we realize that some of the things that were embraced um, by, say, conservative members of the society uh, 200 years ago and what was embraced by what we would refer to as conservatives today, different uh, ideas. So let's, get, let's figure out and come up with some, uh, some definitions here. Uh, we'll start off with conservatism, and conservatism is the, um, conservatism is, uh, the belief of conservatism is, is it emphasizes uh, maintaining existing institutions, maintaining traditional institutions, rather. Um, the idea of uh, the, the driving force of the emphasis of conservatism is social stability. And this is really kind of get, um, get a boost from the mess that the French Revolution had turned into uh, in the 1790s. Uh, this idea that, um, that whoa, too, too much liberty, too much liberalization, if we could say, is destabilizing and causes huge problems in the society. So uh, conservatism is kind of a, a response to that. So the idea behind conservatism is the is the belief in maintaining traditional institutions, and the purpose of that is to uh, maintain social stability. Uh, liberalism, on the other hand, is the belief of, of actively changing existing institutions in order to increase freedom and, um, and justice within the society. And the, um, the emphasis uh, in, uh, in liberalism is going to be... Um, is going to be uh, social justice, in essence, um, it, it concepts of social justice. Now, another uh, term that we can use here that, uh, that I like to use and like to talk about is radicalism. And radicalism is ten tends to be associated with liberalism uh, in that uh, radicals also believe in, in social change. Um, the goal of radicals, or at least the, the underlying belief of radicalism, or what makes radicalism radical, is that uh, radicals tend to see one specific thing, one overarching problem within society, and uh, believe that that one overarching uh, problem in society needs to be changed, basically needs to be eliminated immediately in order for society to progress. 
Um, so the, the radicals kind of take liberalism a, a step further here. Uh, and of course the goal and the emphasis of radicalism is usually equality, some form of, uh, you know, of, of equality, be it political equality or, uh, uh, or social equality, and we take that to the furthest extent. Uh, the radicals will tend to uh, recognize uh, the equivalent, uh, uh, equality among everybody, whereas liberals are uh, maybe... Yeah, we have this overriding idea of equality and justice, um, but we're, we're going to be a little bit more temperate about that. So these ideas are, are going to drive, or uh, are going to drive uh, what we're going to be talking about for much of the uh, of the rest of the year, and they are going to be definitive during the uh, the period that we're talking about now. Um, we're talking about the eighteen uh, hundred, the uh, early eighteen hundreds, late eighteenth century, early nineteenth century. Also, we have to understand something here, that, that the definitions that I've given you uh, for conservatism and liberalism are going to shift over time, that actual positions taken by conservatives, liberals, radicals uh, do not remain constant, but change over time. We're going to see an example of that, but uh, think of just about liberalism in and of itself. Uh, what happens when the liberals win and their ideas become institutionalized? Well, after about 100 years or 200 years, or however long you want to put it, uh, the what used to be a liberal idea, so for instance, free market capitalism, uh, 200 years ago was a pretty, in some cases, a very radical liberal idea, um, actually wins out and then becomes institutionalized and then um, defending those institutions, those institutions become traditional and therefore tends to become more in the, uh, in the realm of conservatism in preserving those traditional uh, societies. So that uh, liberalism today, um, as we know it in the United States, yeah, it tends to not really look at the free market capitalism uh, you know, as something that they really want to emphasize. Uh, moving along, now during this time, of course, we have some political shifts that are taking place. There were huge uh, shifts, political shifts, that are going to emerge as a result of the American Revolution. Remember, uh, as a result of the American Revolution, pretty much the top echelon of society, those people representing uh, the king, were sloughed off, which means that there's a, there's a, there are voids that need to be filled. So before the revolution, if we want to talk, take a look at liberalism and conservatism, we would probably say that liberalism was represented by the Tories. Um, these were your pro-Britain, um, you know, pro-royalty, pro-king, these were your loyalists. Whereas liberalism would have been represented by your, I guess these, <coughs> by your Whigs. Uh, now, these are not formal, uh, necessarily formal political parties in the United States, but, but they are political ideas and they are forms of, of identity. Your Whigs tended to be your pro-colonial. They tended to represent your large landowners um, or your merchant, your large merchant interests, and they were your, lo they were your liberal wing. But now, of course, as a result of the American Revolution, what happened to the Tories? Well, gone. Now, the Tories are a political non-entity. Were there still poor, uh, Tories in the United States after the American Revolution? Sure, but so what? Um, they were a non-entity as far as politics was concerned. So now we have to say, well, wait a minute. What is the conservative position going to be after the American Revolution? Well, guess what? It ends up being the Whig position. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the support for the large landowners and the, and the large merchants uh, these were these were your liberal. This was your liberal position. This was your social change position, putting them, uh, you know, in the in the realm of power. Uh, well, now that they're there, and they're going to represent their own interests, and of course, they tended to be the the more powerful people within within the colonies. Now that that top echelon has been sloughed off, this becomes your now your top echelon, and of course. These, uh, these, these were major, for instance, the Adams family in, in the Northeast was a traditional merchant family. They, they had traditional interests that went back generations. Your large plantation landowners in the South, like Jefferson and Washington, um, these were, these were, they had uh, interests that went back generations as well. So, um, so these are going to become your more conservative elements in society. Uh, not, not that Jefferson himself was a conservative during this time period, but we'll, we'll take a look at that a little bit more in general uh, in a moment. Um, your more liberal position is going to be uh, the, among the Democrats. 
Okay, these are folks who are not necessarily representing the large landowners, but rather small landowners or even non-landowners. Uh, how about getting a little bit of political capital for these particular groups? So this, is, this becomes your liberal position during this time period. Um, so now how do these, these uh, political parties develop and how do they, they start to, uh, to form? Well, they largely uh, developed as a result of a conflict between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. Uh, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams uh, during the American Revolution had been largely friends. Uh, they had, been, in fact, been pretty good friends. But uh, after the American Revolution, when, the, when these different political ideas uh, started to compete, uh, Jefferson and John, uh, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams are going to come to loggerheads, and they are really going to come to loggerheads. In fact, they will become very bitter enemies as a result of the, uh, of the conflicts that they're, that they'll, that they're going to experience. Um, but the political parties that emerge during this time are going to be the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans, or what your textbooks, uh, what your textbook out of many uh, refers to as the Jeffersonian Republicans. Um, well, c clearly. So our leaders here with regard to the Federalists um, were, well, John Adams was, of course, a, a major leader of the Federalists, but also, and very importantly, Alexander Hamilton. <clears throat> and Alexander Hamilton and John Adams are going to, to put together a pretty, pretty cohesive uh, uh, Federalist institution here. Of course, uh, this is going to start with your Federalist papers and, the, uh, and, um, and organizing people to gain support of the uh, United States Constitution. Uh, the basic beliefs, uh, the basic belief of the Federalists is the Federalists, of course, uh, wanted to have a strong central government that was going to uh, help organize things. And, of course, again, the focus of conservatism is this idea of stability. They, the Federalists believe that the best way of creating a stable society is to have a relatively strong uh, central government. Um, some of the goals uh, of the Federalists, the goals wanted to uh, build a, central, uh, a strong central bank. Uh, they wanted to develop the, uh, the interests of businesses and, uh, and some large landowners in, uh, in the United States. Um, they tended to identify as being pro-British uh, to maintain those traditional ties to Britain. Uh, ideologically speaking, uh, the Federalists were largely conservative. Uh, now, is there some variation there? Sure, absolutely. And um, for the most part, who was their follower? How, who were their adherents? Who were the folks that they could get to vote for them? Well, for the most part, uh, merchants, uh, major property owners, and also urban workers who were tied in with the, with the rising um, industrialization and manufacturing base um, that were involved in business uh, interests. On the other hand, um, of course, we had the Anti-Federalists, the Anti-Federalists weren't necessarily a cohesive group, but um, well, those folks who were a little bit weary of the Constitution are ultimately going to be uh, organized under the leadership of Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, um, among others, there's Aaron Burr and some other folks. Uh, these folks uh, believed, contrary to the Federalists, they believed that the best bet for securing liberty and securing freedom was to have a weaker central government, of course, you know, uh, and uh, to bolster the power of the states relative to the, uh, to the federal government. The goals of the, um, uh, of the, uh, the Democratic Republicans uh, is to, um, to they, don't want, they don't like this idea of the banks, um, they want to, uh, to develop the, the nation's agriculture. They weren't particularly interested in the manufacturing center. They weren't particularly interested in, in, in growing industrialization. Um, and uh, let's see. Uh, oh, yeah, and that, that's about that's the, basic, uh, the basics there. Now, the, um, the ideology or their identity tended to be very pro-French, especially during the time of the French Revolution. Which seemed like a good idea at the time, and then as we realize here, the French Revolution didn't work, end up as planned, and the United States ended up in a major conflict with France as a result of this. And this is going to be very problematic for the Jeffersonian Republicans and the Democratic Republicans. Um, the adherents, who could they rely on for, uh, for votes, in essence, um, your southern planters? Uh, also your northern farmers, and also folks further out into the frontier uh, or into the west or folks that the, uh, the Democratic Republicans could count on for votes. Um, so what we kind of start seeing here is you start to see some very, very 
Uh, clear alliances, political alliances, and political divisions developing. Pl developing. Also, too, you can kind of start to see where we're going to see some regional differences, where the Federalists are going to pull most of their uh, most of their authority from the pardon me from the uh, from the Northeast, from New England area, and also from maybe the um, the coastal cities. Whereas the Democratic Republicans are going to be more uh, focused on the South and the Western part of the country. Now, all of this starts to take shape, really start to take shape, uh, during the time of the, uh, the election of John Adams, uh, the Adams presidency. Now, as you remember, John Adams was, uh, was George Washington's uh, vice president and almost to a certain extent kind of the heir to George Washington. Uh, you know, and he is going to win the election of 1796. Remember, this, these are not necessarily polit, um, you know, popular elections. These were decided in, in the, um, the Electoral College. And, um, and as, it, as it turned out, as you remember from the, the original Constitution, the original Constitution says, well, uh, whoever wins the majority votes gets to be president, but whoever wins the second uh, it ends up becoming the vice president. So this kind of created a, a strange situation in which uh, John Adams was the president, but his political rival, Thomas Jefferson, was his vice president. What could possibly go wrong with having your political rival as your vice president? Well, yeah, exactly. And Thomas Jefferson was not too good a person to try to undercut um, the president of the United States when he didn't, th when he didn't believe in the things that the president was doing. Um, so, overall, uh, as far as domestic policies are concerned, the Adams presidency largely uh, continued on the traditions of George Washington. The things that, that Washington was, was focusing on uh, were the things that, that Adams was going to focus on. However, uh, one major change to his d domestic policies is he is going to end up responding to some of the really vicious attacks uh, by Jefferson and uh, the Democratic Republicans that were coming that were coming at him and criticizing his uh, his presidency and probably the key criticism of Adams's presidency at this point was actually in foreign policy. Now, um, now as you remember, the United States had a military alliance with France, and and France was at war with Britain. So France was trying to get the United States to participate in that war with Britain, this long-standing war with Britain. And, um, and the United States under George Washington just would not do it. They would not get involved. So, um, so France decides, all right, well, if you're, gonna, you're basically then siding with the British. You're continuing to trade with them. So the French decided that they were going to go on and they were going to capture American ships. Uh, they were going to impress American soldiers. Um, and this was becoming a real problem. People were starting to get very, very angry with the French. So um, Adams sends his, uh, his people to Paris, sends his diplomats to Paris, and, um, and in something known as the XYZ affair, because the agents uh, were, uh, were referred to as X, Y, and Z, the French diplomats uh, insisted that the American diplomats pay to conduct diplomacy. In other words, they were, they were looking for a bribe. They were looking for a handout from the American diplomats, and the American diplomats refused to give it to them. Uh, this is going to outrage the American public. The, the American public is going to say, All right, we'll spend millions of dollars to defend our nation if necessary, but we're not going to give one cent for tribute to any foreign country. We're not going to do it. Um, and the pressure is now on, especially from the Hamilton end of the, uh, of the Federalist Party, uh, to really start putting the pressure on France. Um, and in fact... We're, we're starting to see now, especially in the Caribbean, where American ships are, are getting uh, attacked. Well, many of them are fighting back. And in fact, uh, the Adams presidency is actually going to start to uh, consign profiteers to, uh, to you know, kind of return the battle to the French ships and also uh, establishing, you know, uh, naval ships, American naval ships to protect American uh, uh, merchant ships from being attacked by the French. So now we're actually kind of getting into almost a shooting war with, with the French Navy. Um, and there's going to be an awful lot of pressure on Adams to just flat out go to war with France. Let's just declare war on France and call it a day. Adams does not want to do this. He's listened to what, uh, what George Washington uh, has, has suggested in his farewell address. He does not want to get involved uh, in, this, uh, in these uh, wars between Britain and France. He's going to keep the country out of it. He wants to try to remain neutral uh, with France. 
Um, however, a group that he does not want to remain neutral with is the Jeffersonians. The Jeffersonians are attacking him on every uh, on every course, uh, you know, uh, and um, and to kind of mitigate some of these attacks, um, Adams is going to pass some crucial or, or going to push, and the Federalist Congress is going to pass uh, some pretty controversial acts. Uh, first and foremost is the Natural uh, Naturalization Act. And that is going to say, if you are an immigrant and you want to become an American citizen, uh, you are required to remain in the country for 14 years, whereas the law previous to this only allowed, only required five years. Well, why would he do that? Well, it turns out that immigrants uh, tended to be Democratic Republicans. They tended to vote with, Je uh, with Jefferson and his crew. Also, too, we want to make sure that none of these aliens, none of these... Uh, None of these immigrants coming into the United States are going to mean any harm. So, um, so Adams brought it upon himself to uh, to basically capture and imprison and deport uh, aliens, uh, or illegal immig or Im immigrants. It wasn't necessarily illegal immigrants, but immigrants in general, um, just upon suspicion that they're up to something no good. Again, to try to neutralize part of Jefferson's, uh, uh, you know, uh, electoral base. And these were the Alien and the Alien Enemies Acts. Um, and also we have, very controversially, the Sedition Act. And the Sedition Act made it illegal. Now listen to this. Now remember, this was a country that is protected under First Amendment rights, okay? Uh, according to this act, um, the, uh, the government, it, is, it becomes illegal to make a false, scandalous, or, eh, listen to this, malicious uh, statement against the government. Now, uh, writing false and uh, and um, sca false information, we can kind of understand is is being problematic. But scandalous and malicious, well, anything you know, if you write something that is truthful that could cause a scandal, you've broken the law. If you say something mean, uh, you know, mean-hearted, even if it's true, or or your perception of the truth. That could be breaking the law, and um, and in a country that is protected by by a First Amendment right to freedom of speech and freedom of the press, this idea of of sedition is really really problematic, and the Jeffersonians are gonna go ballistic. They're going to just attack uh, the Adams administration because of these of these particular laws, of course. Uh, one of these uh, folks who, who attacks Adams is a fellow by the name of James Callender. And he writes, the reign of Mr. Adams. Wow, whoa, look at this. Look at the, the reign. Right. Who has a reign? It's not a president. A president doesn't have a reign. A president uh, has a time in office. A king has a reign. So he's there. This is probably the ultimate political insult in, in the uh, late 18th century is to refer to somebody in kingly ways, a uh, president in, in kingly terms. Uh, the reign of Mr. Adams has hitherto been one continued tempest of malignant passions. Malignant passions? Really? Really? James, uh, John Adams was known for his rather stoic temperament. Um, uh, as uh, uh, certainly not a, a man of his of passions. Uh, he was a passionate man, but not 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 a, a believer. As president, he has never opened his lips or lifted his pen without threatening and scolding. Never, really. Uh, you can kind of see here that in political writing and in this kind of uh, slamming, uh, the, there's a tendency to use absolutes. Uh, and absolutes are usually indefensible. It's unlikely that the president has never opened his lips uh, without school. Uh, the grand object of his administration has been to exasperate the rage of contending parties. Really, that's what he was trying to do? That's his grand object? He just wants to tick people off? Uh, to calumniate and destroy every man who differs from his, uh, his opinions. I don't know. The Jeffersonians were saying some pretty nasty things about, uh, about Adams. Every person holding an office must either quit it or think and vote exactly with Mr. Adams. Now, clearly, uh, this is something that is pretty intense. Uh, obviously, this is somebody who is, a, uh, who is a political opponent of Mr. Adams and is not necessarily trying to make a factual statement, but rather a, uh, you know, a, a, you know, a powerful statement uh, criticizing the power of Adams. And sure enough, James Callender uh, was a Jeffersonian. 
Uh, he was writing this during the, during the election year, uh, so, you know, 1800, uh, when Jefferson was running against uh, Adams uh, in, the, in the election of 1800. And ultimately, uh, Calendar will be put in jail for, the, for this and other writings. Uh, so he kind of had a bit of an axe to grind on this one. So uh, the Jeffersonians are going to respond to these acts quite aggressively. And in fact, uh, Thomas Jefferson and James Madison are going to uh, put into or are going to actually secretly write a couple of resolutions known as the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions. Uh, uh, Madison wrote the, re the resolution for the state of Virginia. Uh, Jeff Jefferson wrote the resolution for the state of uh, Kentucky. And the purpose of this was to respond to this, this power grab. And let's be fair, it was a power grab on the part of Adams and the Federalists and Congress uh, to kind of neutralize their stance. Uh, they're going to respond to this by, um, by drafting resolutions that, that offer a couple of uh, concepts. One of them was the compact theory, this idea that uh, the, country, the, the, um, the states in the country have basically joined together uh, by a contractual arrangement. And that contract is the Constitution of the United States. And as you recall, the Jeffersonians, uh, the Democratic Republicans, the Jeffersonians, believed in a strict adherence to the Constitution. Um, and the idea of this is if the states do not uh, or I'm sorry, if the federal government does not adhere to a strict interpretation of the Constitution, that the states have the right to nullify any laws that they, uh, that they feel are unconstitutional. In other words, the states can simply say, this particular law passed by the federal government is a violation of the Constitution, and we are not going to, fi we're not going to follow this law. Um, this is the idea of nullification. So clearly, this is, this is a huge, huge states' rights Concept, and as you know from the uh, the Jeffersonian Democrats, uh, the power of the states and empowering the states relative to the federal government was a key goal of those uh, of those um, those, uh, those those that party. Uh, let's see here. Now, in eighteen hundred, this was all put to the test, and this was the election of eighteen hundred, or what a lot of your textbooks, and in fact Jefferson himself, referred to as the Revolution of 1800. And uh, this is a, uh, an electoral map. These maps are very, very important. And how are we going to read this map? Well, uh, what you'll see is the, uh, the states in blue uh, uh, voted for Thomas Jefferson and also another fellow by the name of Aaron Burr, uh, who is also a Jeffersonian, uh, um, a Jeffersonian uh, a Democratic Republican. And um, these states in green voted for John Adams and, um, and uh, Charles Pinckney, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, for some reason, it didn't show up in the, in the box. Now, here's where there's a problem. These states here, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and North Carolina, uh, they've, they split their vote between Jefferson and Adams. This is a problem. And in fact, if you actually take a look at a, a closer county to by county, um, map, you'll find that these, uh, that these sections actually voted relative to the, um, to the seaboard. With those areas of the, uh, of the, of the state closer to the, what, closer to the east voting for Adams, whereas those, uh, those counties that were further toward the west voted for Jefferson. And this is going to become, this is going to create the first electoral conflict in the United States in just our third election, in that um, nobody is going to end up getting a majority vote. That's a problem. So, um, so ultimately, this election, because there, nobody's going to get a, a majority vote, I believe uh, Jefferson received 73 electoral votes, uh, Adams received uh, 60, 53 uh, electoral votes. There was no real clear majority. Uh, Burr ended up with 73 electoral votes. It was, in essence, a tie. So, um, so this was ultimately going to be uh, decided in the House of Representatives. Yes, at that time, the House of Representatives was a Federalist body, uh, for the most part. Uh, but um, Adams isn't going to be able to pull this one out, ultimately. They were kind of hoping that Burr would drop out and give all of his electoral votes to Adams. Uh, that did not happen. Burr stayed in it. Um, and just as a matter of attrition, finally, 
Uh, the House of Representatives just kind of gave their vote over to Jefferson and said, all right, Jefferson, you got the most votes. Uh, you get to be president. Uh, consequently, it also created a situation with regard to who's going to be vice president. Uh, and in this case, it'll, it'll turn out to be Aaron Burr. But um, ultimately, the 12th Amendment will be added to the Constitution as a result of this election and also the election of 1796 where it became obvious that, um, that just giving the second vote to the, um, giving the vice presidency to the person who had the second highest votes is not an efficient way of doing this, especially when you have a party system uh, that has developed. Uh, so the 12th Amendment will be added to the Constitution to kind of... Um, to, to make, put the, um, the vice president on a separate ballot so that you elect for a president in one ballot and a vice president in another, in another ballot. Um, and what is really going to be significant about this particular um, election of 1800 is this is the first time in the history of the United States, in the relatively short history of the United States, that, um, that the power has shifted um, between one institution to another institution, in this case the, from the Federalists uh, represented by Washington and Adams and Hamilton to the, uh, to the Jeffersonian Democrats of the Democratic Republicans represented by Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, Aaron Burr. Um, and the most significant part of this is that this transfer of power took place uh, evenly. Uh, uh, peacefully. So John Adams is ultimately going to say, all right, you won, you're the winner, you're the president, I'm done. And he's going to retire from public office. Um, still a tremendous amount of, uh, of bitterness between uh, Jefferson and Adams, um, but ultimately after they've both retired from, pu from public life, Adams and Jefferson will make up, and uh, some of the letters that they shared uh, uh, in their observances about what was going on in the country um, were are really, really good, really valuable sources. Uh, ultimately, uh, I believe it was 1821, July 4th, 1820, 1821, uh, John Adams will be lying in his deathbed, and he will ultimately, uh, his last words will be, um, at least Jefferson lives. And ironically, on the very same day, uh, Thomas Jefferson was also on his deathbed. Uh, Adams and Jefferson will pass on the very same day. Um, but either way, moving along, now, this party system, I'm not going to go, I'm not going to delve too into this. I don't want to read all this out to you because I don't want to spend that much time. But these are two very different, um, well, not necessarily two very different, but these are two perspectives on uh, the rise of the political parties and the benefits of, uh, of, the, par of the political party system that has developed uh, during this time period. I want you to take a look at these. Uh, this one comes from the American Pageant. This one comes from your textbook, Out of Many, and they're offering some two, two different ideas. Uh, what I'd like you to do in your notes is kind of take a look at and, and evaluate the validity of these two particular statements. Uh, is there more that can be said about the, the rise of political parties? What about tying these, uh, the, these, this idea of political parties to what is going on politically today? Uh, to what extent does the political party system still uh, convey these... Um, uh, these uh, these advantages. Uh, also, uh, you I, you will notice when you take a look at your notes that I have a table here that highlights the uh, a summary of Federalist beliefs and Democratic Republican beliefs. Um, just fill it in. There's nothing for you to do but to, to just fill it in. I think it's a, a helpful study guide. This comes from the American Pageant, and I thought it would be uh, helpful to you. Also, there is a rather um, generalized chart of the evolution of political parties from 1792 to today. We, as we all know, we're still under this kind of two-party system. Um, you know, for better or for worse, and we'll, discuss, we'll discuss how this works out as we go along. But um, this is just a, a very, very general uh, evolutionary chart to show um, where our current political parties evolved from out of this, uh, out of this, out of this, uh, this, this issue. Uh, we'll talk about the, the era of good feelings later on, uh, but for now, this is all the news that's fit to print on my end. Uh, have a good day.